Hello, everyone, and welcome to another recorded lecture of Bio 101 Online. Uh, today, we'll be discussing Chapter 3, The Chemistry of Organic Molecules. So what is an organic molecule? It's actually a very simple definition. An organic molecule contains both carbon and hydrogen. And these are two of the 92 elements that naturally occur on planet Earth. And if, they have, if a molecule has carbon and hydrogen, we call it an organic molecule. If you take organic chemistry, you'll study molecules that have carbon and hydrogen. Um, despite there being thousands of different organic molecules in our cells, there are only four classes that all of them belong to. So in all living things, there can be tens, or I should say five to 10,000 different types of molecules, different organic molecules that have carbon and hydrogen in them. But all of them kind of fall under one of four classes of biomolecules. And bio, right, means life. So these are molecules found in living organisms. So carbohydrates are organic molecules found in living things. Lipids are organic molecules found in living things. Proteins are organic molecules that exist in living things. And finally, nucleic acids are organic molecules that exist in living things. So these four are the biomolecules we'll be discussing today. Crucial to all these biomolecules is the carbon atom. And the carbon atom is very small. It only has six electrons. Um, we know that because the atomic number of carbon is six. How many electrons um, are there in each shell of a carbon atom? So pause here and draw the electrons around the carbon atom and tell me how many valence electrons there are. You should see that there are four valence electrons. So how many bonds can carbon form? Four. If there are four valence electrons, that means carbon wants to make four covalent bonds so it could have its octet filled, right? It wants to have eight electrons total. And carbon likes to bond most with another carbon. Um, we see a lot in organic chemistry that carbon likes to bond as well with nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and even sulfur in some cases. Um, but of course, Carbon and hydrogen are the leading stars of organic chemistry. And the carbon-carbon bond itself is very strong. It's a very stable bond. And carbon can make up to three covalent bonds with another carbon or with a nitrogen, for example. So you could have a double or a triple bond. Um, so there are certain examples of that we'll talk about in a bit. But what we have to know now is that carbon is very versatile. It's very flexible. Um, and we said that it can make up to four covalent bonds. And it can do so in different directions. So there's, um, we can have some that are just linear chains of carbon. So this is very basic. Um, and when you look at the carbons, this represents the backbone or the skeleton. This is called the carbon skeleton. The basic chain of carbons is really, that's just the skeleton. And there's an endless diversity of carbon skeletons. They can be very uh, simple and linear, like ethane or propane, or they can be arranged in rings, like a benzene ring, or they can have branches. They could be branched off like an isobutane. So that these carbon atoms make different shapes. Uh, but one thing is for sure, they all have um, a valence elect that four valence electrons and they make four bonds with their neighbors. So all of these carbons are very stable and they're happy. So pause here and tell me what type of bond connects carbon atoms and a carbon skeleton. And the answer is C covalent. The simplest organic molecules would just be carbon and hydrogen and well, look at one that has just one carbon atom, methane. Methane has one carbon atom. And since, again, carbon has four valence electrons, it wants to make four covalent bonds with hydrogen. So here we have carbon in the middle. This is a central carbon. And it's going to make four bonds with hydrogen. And that's methane. So methane is a gas. Um, and you can think about ethane would just be two carbons. So it'd be two carbons with hydrogens around it. 
propane that you might use in a barbecue has three carbons and hydrogen. So hydrocarbons are molecules that just have hydrogen and carbon. They're very simple. We can look at larger hydrocarbons as well. So as carbon skeletons grow in size, so do their energy storing capacity. Remember from chapter two that bonds store energy. So the large hydrocarbons store energy in the carbon-carbon covalent bonds. And if you look at the structure for gasoline or diesel or motor oil, these are all large hydrocarbons. So we can use these as fuel. Um, and with combustion, when we ignite our car uh, with combustion, we can break all of these bonds and use that energy to move our vehicle forward. Um, we'll also see very soon that fatty acids look a lot like this. The fatty acids that are in our french fries that we eat that give us energy as well um, look very much like large hydrocarbons and again those carbon carbon bonds store energy in them in addition to the carbon skeleton we need to make each molecule special right each molecule has something that makes it unique and that is the functional groups the functional groups are clusters of specific atoms that are bonded to the carbon skeleton and again, these functional groups each have a unique structure and function. These are some examples of functional groups. They're just clusters of atoms um, in a specific arrangement. And these are like add-ons to the carbon skeleton. But that's what makes the molecule what it is. So functional groups determine the chemical reactivity, like what it can bond with, and also the polarity, right? what it can mix and interact with of the organic molecules. So you can see an example, OH is called a hydroxyl group and that's found in alcohols. It's also found in amino acids it's in certain cases. Here's a carboxyl group. This is always found in amino acids. So you can see over here in this amino acid, this is a carbon, but then it has this functional group, this C double bond with an oxygen with another OH. So that's this functional group over here. It's very common in biology. On the other side of this carbon, you have an NH2. That's called an amino functional group. That's shown here. So an amino acid has an amino group, amino functional group, and a carboxylic acid functional group. That's why they're called amino acids. More on that later. But right now, I want you to understand that functional groups uh, are added to carbon skeletons, and that's what makes molecules unique. It gives them their characteristics and it determines what it can interact with and what it can bond with. Uh, for this class, you should know hydroxyl, that is OH. Um, you should know carboxyl, the carboxylic acid, C double bond OOH. You should know amino, and you should be familiar with phosphate as well. You can also see that there's a sulfhydryl group with a sulfur in it that's present in the cysteine amino acid, one of the amino acids. So each type of organic molecule has a unique three-dimensional shape. And for all molecules, especially in biology, the shape, the structure determines its function. So this structure is of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. Because this is structured in such a way, this is sugar. This is glucose. If this were not structured in such a way, or this, this could be something else actually, but if this were not structured in this way, then it would not be a sugar anymore. If I were to take out one of these carbon atoms, it would no longer be a sugar because that would change its shape and the shape determines its function. So keep that in mind as we talk today about different structures and how those structures would affect their function. So an isomer, an isomer um, means that the two organic molecules have the same molecular formula, but they have different arrangements of atoms. So let's just take an example of two molecules, one's glyceraldehyde and one's dihydroxyacetone, both have six hydrogens, three oxygens, and three carbons. So it's C3H6O3. However, they look very different because of the arrangement of their atoms. So these are called isomers of each other. So dihydroxyacetone and glyceraldehyde are isomers. 
So I want to define some terms that are going to be very relevant in the coming slides. Um, we already said that in all living things, we have four main categories of macro molecules. Macro means large. Um, they are also called biomolecules. And these macromolecules um, can sometimes consist of small repeating subunits. And if this macromolecule has small repeating subunits, that macromolecule is called a polymer. So a polymer is a macromolecule that consists of small repeating subunits. This pearl necklace is a polymer. It's like a macromolecule. It's a very large molecule. And it's a polymer because it has repeating subunits of pearls. Right? It's many of the same subunit, many pearls strung together. So that's what makes it a polymer. And a monomer is the singular subunit that would make up the polymer. So the, what is the monomer of this pearl necklace, right? One singular pearl. So their monomers get bonded together to make polymers, right? And that's shown in this image below. A mon monomer is a small molecule and a polymer is a long chain molecule made up of repeated patterns of monomers. So we'll see that nucleic acids, uh, amino acids, nucleic acids, and uh, carbohydrates all have this kind of um, polymerization happening. You have small subunits that get built up into larger uh, polymers. So we said the four categories are carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So we'll talk about um, these polymers first. So again, carbohydrates is a polymer. Proteins are a polymer. And these are individual monomers. Nucleic acids are polymers. And these are individual monomers. So this is a good table uh, to keep in mind. This is table 3.2. I would like you, there's actually a blank table in the back of the learning map uh, that has each category a biomolecule and has you uh, fill in the subunit. What is the monomer? And what are some examples? Um, you should also know what elements are found in each category of biomolecule. So now let's talk about how molecules like this get made. Right? How do monomers become a polymer? A dehydration reaction must occur. So a dehydration reaction is a special chemical reaction in which subunits are connected by the formation of a covalent bond. And it's called a dehydration reaction because water is released during this reaction as a byproduct. <clears throat> so a chemical reaction will occur called a dehydration reaction that can connect two monomers uh, by a covalent bond and water is released during that bond formation. So an example of this would be how starch, which is a polymer, um, gets made from glucose subunits, which are the monomer. So suppose we have two monomers. This is an example of dehydration synthesis. Um, you can assume that this end has an H and this end has an OH as well, but this is highlighted um, because we're gonna make a bond right over here between these two monomers. So for this to happen, um, usually you need an enzyme. Uh, we'll talk about what that is um, at another time, but an enzyme will usually bring these two monomers together. Um, but for now, let's just focus on the dehydration aspect. What happens is these two monomers come together and H2O gets eliminated. It gets dehydrated. And as a result, this new polymer got synthesized. Um, this covalent bond got put in, right? These uh, two monomers got connected and water got kicked out. So this is called a synthesis reaction or a dehydration reaction. So when we build things, right, when you want to polymerize things, some smaller things, we're doing dehydration reactions. So you should write that down, make sure that makes sense to you, right? Poly polymerization is done by dehydration reactions. How do polymers degrade into monomers? So it's, it's a different type of reaction altogether, but it still involves water. Um, and this time it's called a hydrolysis reaction. And hydro means water and lysis means breaking. 
It's a good word to know. So write that down. Lysis and lys, L-Y-S, is breaking. Um, so a water molecule is now going to be used to break a covalent bond. So when we want to digest starch into glucose monomers, we have to use water to break the covalent bonds that normally attach the glucoses together in starch. So we start down here. This is a polymer. And now we're going to degrade this polymer with a hydrolysis reaction. So we need water. And again, this is often done by an enzyme. So the enzyme will help with this process. But water is used to break this bond and form two separate monomers. This has been hydrolyzed. And then, of course, if you want to bring them together, that's dehydration again. So dehydration helps synthesis. Hydrolysis helps degradation. So answer this question now. You can pause here. The answer is C. So carbohydrates. So carbohydrates all contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms in a one to two to one ratio. So all carbohydrates have these three elements. Um, it's indicated by their name actually. So carb is carbon, O for oxygen, and hydrogen. Um, hydra part for hydrogen. So carbohydrates have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a specific ratio. Um, so if there's one carbon atom, that means there are two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. That's the set ratio. So sugar, um, like glucose, as we'll see, is an example of a carbohydrate that has C6H12O6, which is a one to two to one ratio. And the functions of carbohydrates are usually an immediate energy source for organisms. So almost every organism relies on carbohydrates as an immediate energy source. And these are also, uh, carbohydrates are used in certain organisms um, to provide a structural role as well. So in plants, for example, carbohydrates are not only an energy source, but they're also a building material. Um, so they have a structural role as well. Um, and bacteria as well. So we said that the functions of carbohydrates were immediate energy source, they provide a building material in some organisms, and regardless of the function, all carbohydrates are polymers of monosaccharides. So monosaccharide means single sugar. Um, so that's the monomer that make up all carbohydrates. And we'll talk about different varieties of carbohydrates, talking uh, first about monosaccharides, so those simple single sugars. We'll then talk about disaccharides, double sugars. And then finally, we'll talk about polysaccharides, complex sugars. So pause here and answer this question. So the answer is B, if it had seven carbons, a carbohydrate would have 14 hydrogens and seven oxygens. Let's start by talking about the most basic carbohydrates, monosaccharides. So these are the simple sugars. We here um, have examples of glucose, C6H12O6. It has this ring form. And here's fructose, C6H12O6. Um, ask yourself now, what describes the relationship between glucose and fructose? They have the same molecular formula, but they have different structures, right? These are isomers of each other. These are isomers. Um, you can also see here's ribose, which has five carbons. Um, so this is a ribo, a five carbon sugar is referred to as a ribose, whereas a six carbon sugar is a hexose. Um, Sorry, the ribose is a pentose, is a five carbon sugar, it's a pentose like a pentagon. And these are like hexagons. Um, so this is a hexose. And like I said, glucose, fructose, and galactose all have the same chemical formula, C6H12O6. But since they have different structures, we call them isomers. Simple sugars are water soluble. They dissolve readily in water. Um, does that mean that they're hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Right, it means that they're hydrophilic. Um, and it's specifically these hydroxyl groups. Um, the oxygen has electrons 
on it um, that enable them to make hydrogen bonds with water. So the OH groups on sugar make it water soluble and enable hydrogen bonding um, with neighboring water molecules. So these make a solution together where sugar is the solute and water is the solvent. So which of the following is not a monosaccharide based on what we just saw, right? Table sugar is actually not a monosaccharide. So glucose, fructose, and galactose um, are monosaccharides. Table sugar is a disaccharide. So a disaccharide is a double sugar. They're made by joining two monosaccharides with a special covalent bond called a glycosidic bond. What type of reaction joined these two monomers together? Right, it was a dehydration reaction, right? A dehydration reaction. And what kind of reaction can separate a disaccharide into two simple sugars? So a hydrolysis reaction. So here's an example of a double sugar that you might've had today already. Um, this is sucrose. So table sugar, the sugar that you put in your tea or coffee looks like this. It's a glucose monosaccharide bonded to a fructose monosaccharide. So together they're a disaccharide. So sucrose is a glucose bonded to a fructose. Um, if I want to now, this is lactose. This is a disaccharide. And the enzyme, one of the enzymes that can break down lactose is called beta-galactosidase. And that breaks down lactose into the two monosaccharides, galactose and glucose. So what type of reaction, what kind of enzyme is this, right? This is a hydrolytic enzyme. This is hydrolysis. Um, this enzyme will use water to break this glycosidic bond and separate the lactose into its two monomers. So examples you should know in biology are lactose, which is the sugar found in milk. That's a galactose and a glucose together. We have sucrose, which is table sugar, that's glucose and fructose together. And maltose, which is found in beer. It's the natural, um, it gets, what starch gets broken down into um, by an enzyme called amylase is maltose. So these are double glucoses held together by a glycosidic bond. You might have heard of the enzyme lactase before. Um, lactose, so I just want to point out if it ends in an os, like glucose, lactose, sucrose, that's a sugar. So you should write that down. If it has an ose ending, it's usually a sugar. If it has an ace ending, ase, it's usually an enzyme. So I'd write that down. Os is a suffix for a sugar. Ace is a suffix for an enzyme. So the example I want to give you, um, some lactose or some individuals are lactose intolerant, meaning that they don't have the enzyme lactase that can normally break down lactose into galactose and glucose. So again, when we consume milk, this is lactose. And normally, many of us have the enzyme to normally break this down. Um, lactase is the enzyme that breaks the glycosidic bond. Some individuals, um, based on genetics, um, with have, which have a lot to do with ethnicity, do not have the enzyme to break down lactose. And therefore, it becomes unmetabolized in the digestive system, which could cause some discomfort. Uh, so. Luckily, there's an enzyme supplement. So this is called a lactate pill. So you might have heard about this. I'm sure you have. A lactate pill is just a lactase enzyme. It's a pilled form of the enzyme that can break down this bond. So your body can then absorb the glucose and the galactose separately. So now we'll talk about polysaccharides, which is a polymer of monosaccharides. And I want you to know three examples at least of polysaccharides. Um, starch provides long-term energy storage in plants. Glycogen does the same for animals. And cellulose is a polysaccharide found in the cell walls of plants. Um, the book also talks about chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. We'll talk about that in a bit, um, but we'll talk about starch first.
So it's a polysaccharide found in plants. And since it's a polysaccharide, it's many glucose molecules attached together. So plants like corn and potatoes store their energy in the form of starch. So starch, and again, is just glucose. So the plant can clip off some glucoses as needed, um, but starch is a good storage um, form of glucose. We have the same idea um, as animals. We have glycogen in our liver and glycogen is also a polysaccharide. So again, it's a chain. It's a polymer of many glucoses attached together. The way that the glucoses are linked um, is different in glycogen as compared to starch. So that makes them very different um, structurally. Um, you know, on a structural level, they look very different, but they functionally have the same purpose, right? They both serve as a long-term energy uh, storage um, for plants and animals. So animals store excess blood sugar um, in the form of glycogen in the liver. So glycogen and starch have similar structures because both are made of glucose monomers, but yet they're very different because of the way the glucoses are arranged and connected to each other. So the last example of a polysaccharide you should be very familiar with is cellulose, which is found in plants. It's in fact the most abundant organic compound on the planet. And once again, cellulose is a polysaccharide, so it's a chain of a bunch of, car of uh, glucoses, but again, it's the way that they're oriented. And there's also hydrogen bonding between different glucose chains that makes cellulose so strong and rigid. So it's not only the covalent bonds, the glycosidic bonds that connect the glucoses, but it's also hydrogen bonding between, these are hydrogen bonds between the, um, as are called microfibrils of glucose chains. And when you look at a tree, um, the reason why it can stand upright is because of the rigidity of cellulose. So the paper um, that you're writing on is made of a bark of a tree, which is cellulose. Um, Blades of grass stand up because of cellulose. Cellulose is also, so it's the major component of wood, um, and it's also known as dietary fiber. So on um, a nutrition label, you might see insoluble fiber or dietary fiber, and that refers to the cellulose. And humans um, and many other mammals cannot break down cellulose. So it proceeds undigested through the digestive tract. But certain animals that ruminate um, or chew their cud, quote unquote, like a cow um, or a horse, they can process cellulose. So they actually chew their, they can eat grass and get energy from it because they have certain bacteria in their gut that can break down the cellulose into sugars for energy. We cannot do that. Um, our body cannot process cellulose. It's just dietary fiber. So that's fiber, uh, but we can't use it for energy we need to have the glucose form or the starch form for energy. So this is a nice picture that illustrates the three polysaccharides we spoke about. So here's a man um, picking potatoes and the, let's look first at the potato he's picking. The potato underground is the way that the plant stores energy. So this is starch, right? So the potato is filled with starch. That's actually the bulb of the, the potato plant that's underneath. And we eat potatoes because we could use them for energy too. Then we're looking at the man's muscles has glycogen, right? My, uh, muscles and liver store uh, glucose as glycogen, and that's enabling him to pick the potato from the ground. And finally, the potato plant has leaves above ground that are made of cellulose. So they're all made of glucose monomers, but they're all arranged differently. So you can pause now and answer this question. The answer is C, glycogen. And chitin is used um, as the exoskeleton for some insects and for like a crab is made of chitin. So that's also a carbohydrate. So now we'll talk about lipids next. So lipids are a collection of different hydrophobic molecules. So all lipids are hydrophobic, meaning they're greasy, and all of them have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. 
So they have the same elements as carbohydrates, but they have very different structures. So they have very different properties. And unlike carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids, the other biomolecules, lipids are not built from repeating chains of monomers. So lipids are not chains of, uh, they're not polymers. So keep that in mind. We'll talk about uh, three main types of lipids in this class. The first, or three or four, I should say, um, the first category are the one you're most familiar with, fats and oils. So fats and oils are lipids that are sources of long-term energy. They also help insulation. So for mammals like the blubber of a whale or um, our adipose tissue stores fats um, as not only energy storage, but for also for insulation. So we have a lot of fatty tissue around our heart, for example, to provide it insulation. Fats and oils are made of triglycerides. So the building blocks of uh, fats and oils are triglycerides. That's a, this is a triglyceride. We'll talk about this in a bit. Sterols um, are the steroid base. So a sterol is the alcoholic form of a steroid. So a sterol is the base of many steroid hormones. And steroids are very important for human development, animal development, and also for cell communication. So steroids are, and are also lipids. These are all made from cholesterol. So cholesterol is a type of lipid. And then we'll talk about phospholipids, which make up cell membranes. Um, and phospholipids look a lot like triglycerides, but they're a little bit modified. And then the book talks a little bit about waxes. Um, and I'll talk about waxes in a bit. Um, in a couple of slides, but they're not as biologically important. So triglycerides, we said fats and oils uh, c consist of triglycerides and triglycerides are formed by covalently attaching three fatty acid molecules, right? Tri. So we're taking three fatty acid molecules shown in yellow and we're attaching them to this green glycerol alcohol molecule. So glycerol. And of course, in order to do, to attach things, we need to do a dehydration reaction. So these three fatty acids are being linked to this glycerol. They're being stapled together by dehydration synthesis. And each fatty acid is just a long hydrocarbon chain, right? Bunch of carbons with hydrogens. And at the end, there's a carboxyl functional group. So a triglyceride shown here, right? Those are the building blocks of fats and oils. So the olive oil or the butter, when you zoom in, they're just made of triglycerides, which are three fatty acids stapled to a glycerol. So this is a triglyceride. So the tri refers to the three fatty acids. The glyceride refers to the glycerol that holds it all together. So fatty acids, or this, this is a triglyceride. The fatty acid chains can be either saturated or unsaturated. So all carbons of a saturated fatty acid are bonded to four other atoms. They're sat, meaning another way to think about it is the carbon is saturated with hydrogen and every possible position that there could be a hydrogen, there is. And this makes saturated fatty acids have a very straight shape because of the straight chain of carbons. So saturated fats, that's shown here, um, this is, these are saturated triglycerides and saturated fats are normally solid at room temperature because they can pack very closely together so they can stay solid. An unsaturated fatty acid has at least one double bond in it, which means that, see, there's not a hydrogen here. There's not a hydrogen here. It's unsaturated with hydrogens because of this double bond. And because of the double bond, it gives the fatty acid a little bent shape like this. So it creates a little kink in the fatty acid tail. And what that does is makes the entire fatty acid, the entire triglyceride unable to pack very close together. So these types of unsaturated uh, triglycerides cannot come close together because of this double bond. And because of that reason, they don't solidify. So unsaturated fats are usually liquid 
at room temperature um, because of this double bond makes them unable to pack close together. Um, trans fats, um, I'll show you on the next slide, refer to special double bonds where there are hydrogens on either side. So this refers to a trans bond, whereas this is a cis bond, when you have hydrogens on both sides, on the same side versus hydrogens on opposite sides. And this has some negative health consequences. So a lot of companies that manufacture food, that um, like junk food, uh, try to add hydrogen to unsaturated fats using a process called hydrogenation. This makes the fat more um, stable, so it makes the shelf life longer. And a lot of times fats that are trans fat uh, might taste better. So they might increase the flavor, the texture profile, or the increase the food shelf life. And trans fats um, are now known um, to worsen our health by building up bad cholesterol in our blood vessels. Um, you could read a little bit more about this in this little infographic from the Mayo uh, Clinic and the American Heart Association. But uh, when you're having like bacon or a donut um, or fries, these are usually fried in trans fatty acids. Um, and these are linked to high cholesterol and possibly, uh, possibly a chance of heart attack or stroke. So the FDA now requires uh, trans fat labeling on foods and in restaurants. So pause here and answer this question. And the answer is B. So now we'll talk about phospholipids. Um, and phospholipids are important in cell membranes. So cell membranes, something that every single cell in the universe has, is made up of phospholipids. And phospholipids are unique because while, yes, they do have hydrophobic properties, they also have a hydrophilic portion to it. So this is an exception. So not all lipids are just, just hydrophobic because a phospholipid is hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So hydro, um, so phospholipids shown here have um, two fatty acid tails and a special head. And the head is polar because it has a phosphate group in it, which is negatively charged and can interact with water. And it also has two fatty acid tails that are nonpolar and therefore hydrophobic. If you look at um, the structure of a cell membrane, this is what the cell membrane looks like. They're made up of these little phospholipids and it's actually a double layer of phospholipids. And if you were to zoom in, it looks a lot like a triglyceride, except instead of three fatty acid tails, it has two fatty acid tails. And instead of just a, a regular glycerol, it has like a phosphoglycerol added to it. So it's a phosphate version. So a phospholipid has a polar head that contains phosphate, and it has two nonpolar hydrophobic fatty acid tails. And we'll talk more about the structure and function about phospholipids in the next chapter. Steroids are made up of four fused carbon rings. So when you see these four rings together, that is the shape of a steroid. These are also lipids because they're, um, they're not miscible in water. And interestingly, all of the steroids come from cholesterol. Um, cholesterol is an also a very important component of an animal cell membrane. The cell membrane, in addition to phospholipids, has some cholesterol. So cholesterol is important for the right consistency of membrane, of cell membrane. I will talk about that in the next slide, um, in the next slideshow. Um, but cholesterol is also the base steroid from which your body produces other steroids, like sex hormones that include estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone. So even um, birds like peacocks and peahens utilize the same lipids like testosterone and estrogen um, in order to regulate their mating cycle. Some athletes use synthetic steroids to build muscle quickly. And these are pills that look like the shape of testosterone. So remember, structure determines function. So we're basically, these athletes trick the body into thinking that it's more testosterone 
and that could help promote energy and muscle building. Um, unfortunately, since it mimics testosterone, it can also dysregulate your whole hormonal balance. It disrupts homeostasis of hormones. So it can pose serious health risks and anabolic steroids are illegal for a reason. Waxes are the last category of lipid we'll talk about. Um, waxes, again, are long chain fatty acids um, that are connected to carbon chains connecting alcohol uh, functional groups. And waxes are all solid at room temperature and they all have a waterproofing effect. So in many plants, um, like this plum over here, uh, this plant is covered with a waxy coating to prevent it from dehydrating and from getting desiccated. Uh, so it keeps fruits moist. Um, also, bees secrete a wax that allows them to build the honeycomb to store their honey in. So these are um, hydrophobic, right? So that's why rain doesn't seep in to a fruit and the fruit doesn't swell up from the rain. The leaves of plants have a cuticle uh, layer that's made of wax as well. Um, so these are for protection. Humans, um, we have earwax, not only humans, a lot of uh, mammals have earwax, also called cerumen. So ceruminous glands are glands that produce earwax. And earwax is a protective mechanism. It keeps um, insects out of our ears. It also has an, antibac an antibacterial effect. Um, so it can help repel some pathogens and it also helps trap dust and dirt. Um, so no contaminant can ever reach our eardrum. So these are different examples of waxes. So from earwax to a honeycomb wax to the plant protective cuticle. So a cuticle is what's on the plant's leaves to prevent it from drying out. So lots of examples of waxes. And this is a good um, summary table to review all different types of lipids. We spoke about fats and oils made of triglycerides. Then we spoke about phospholipids and steroids and then waxes. This is a good summary. So you can pause here and answer the question. The answer is B. And now we will talk about protein structure and function. Now is a good time to pause. Um, proteins are probably the most complex of the three of the four classes of biomolecules. So um, we'll talk about proteins right after this. So proteins come in all shapes and sizes. There is great diversity in protein structure as well as protein function. Here are just some of the 3D structures of proteins that you have inside of your cells. Uh, you can see hemoglobin might be familiar, um, an enzyme called catalase, and lysozyme is also catalase is inside of your cells. Lysozyme is an enzyme that you secrete in your tears and your saliva. Myoglobin is found in your muscles. So collagen is found in almost everywhere in your body as a structural protein. So proteins are the hardware of the cell that are found in all living things. Proteins are also found in non-living non things, as we'll soon see. But proteins are very large molecules um, that are found in all living things, and they are the hardware of the cells because they do the work. All proteins are made up of the same monomers um, called amino acids. And amino acids are connected by special covalent bonds called peptide bonds. So all proteins are made up of amino acids connected by peptide bonds. Um, again, there are several categories of proteins. Some include structural proteins like collagen, give your hair um, and your skin structure. Transport proteins help transport things. So in your um, cells, you have to always make sure that you have a low concentration of sodium inside. So special proteins um, kick sodium out. Some proteins are for storage, like hemoglobin um, stores oxygen uh, in our blood. Or motor proteins physically move. Um, so kinesin and myosin are proteins that can use the energy from ATP. Um, we'll, we'll learn about that in a bit. Um, they can use energy 
in order to move things around. Um, there's also a completely separate subset of proteins called enzymes that can catalyze or speed up cellular reactions. And there's a whole chapter dedicated to enzymes that we'll learn about in a bit. Um, so enzymes, again, end in ACE, usually, like lactase, protease. So this is a little cheat sheet um, that talk about some different categories of proteins um, and some of the examples of how they function. So we said that all, all proteins are made of amino acids. And there are 20 different amino acids found in nature. So all proteins are made up of amino acids. There are 20 varieties of amino acids in nature. Amino acids are also called residues or peptides. Um, so a small chain of amino acids is usually called like a peptide. All amino acids have the same chemical structure with the exception of their side chain, AKA the R group. So I want you to pay attention to this, it's important. All amino acids have this kind of structure where the only difference is what's in this R group. That can be one of 20 different things, right? They're functional groups that get added here. So it's the remainder, that's what R stands for, the remainder um, can be one of 20 different things. But regardless, all have an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. And that's why it's called amino acid because it has an NH group, NH2 group. This is a charged amino acid. That's why I could see three. Um, ignore that for now. Uh, and then you have a carboxylic acid group. And it's all around the central carbon. So all amino acids have a carbon with an amino group, a carboxylic acid group, a hydrogen atom, and then an R group, which is one of 20 different things. We always abbreviate the amino end as N apostrophe or N prime. So the amino end is N prime. The carboxylic acid end is C prime. So each amino acid side chain, the R, R group, has very specific properties. Specifically, side chains can be either negatively charged, they can be positively charged, they can be polar and uncharged, meaning hydrophilic, or they can be nonpolar, hydrophobic. And this is incredibly important for the structure of proteins. So each amino acid has its own specific properties, and it's the interaction between many amino acids connected together that determine the protein's structure and the protein's function. That's very important. So this is a list of 20 amino acids. You don't have to memorize them. Each amino acid has a three letter abbreviation and a one letter abbreviation. And in this table, they are categorized by either being negatively charged, positively charged, polar or nonpolar. So again, depending on the side chain, right? That'll determine whether it's negative, positive, polar or nonpolar. And as amino acids connect together, we'll see that the properties of their R groups determine how they'll fold, how they'll interact. So this is um, some examples from the book, just to zoom in um, on what the structures of the R groups actually are. So you can see over here, um, this is a self-hydro group, functional group that's found in an hydrophilic cysteine. Here, you might have heard of uh, lysine is a common amino acid that's positively charged. That's a positive charge in lysine. Um, arginine is also positively charged. But glutamic acid has a negative charge. Aspartic acid has a negative charge. So you can imagine that different proteins that have different sequences of amino acids would interact very different with their environment. Right. So what are the monomers of proteins again? amino acids. How do amino acids attach to each other to make a peptide chain? Dehydration, right? So here we have two amino acids, amino acid one and amino acid two. We have to make a peptide bond between these two amino acids. So a protein can be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of amino acids, all connected by peptide bonds. So you have hundreds and hundreds of dehydration reactions that have to happen. 
So again, remember in dehydration, we're making a covalent bond and removing H2O. So the OH from one of the carboxylic acid groups and an H from one of the amino groups gets eliminated as water. And then we have this special peptide bond that gets formed between the carbon of one amino acid and the nitrogen of another amino acid. And that carbon nitrogen bond is a very strong and stable peptide bond. So all of these amino acids, right? Each of this, this is one amino acid here, right? We have all of these amino acids are connected by peptide bonds. And we call this whole string of amino acids a polypeptide because there are many peptide bonds. Only when this polypeptide folds into its proper shape do we call it a protein. So again, it's not called a protein until it's folded into its proper shape. And that shape is determined by the sequence of amino acids. So we'll talk next about protein structure. And there are four levels of structure that a protein can make. So there's primary, then secondary, tertiary, and sometimes quaternary structures of a protein. The primary structure is the easiest. Um, primary is abbreviated like one with that degree sign. So this is primary. The primary structure of a protein is simply the linear chain of amino acids connected by peptide bonds. So the primary structure is just the chain of amino acids all connected together. Um, so glycine, proline, threonine, glycine, threonine, glycine, they're just a chain of amino acids. Um, and just for um, convention, we have to standardize something. We have to number amino acids. So we know like how we, if you want to say the sixth amino acid, how do I know if I start counting from here or from here, right? Is it one, two, three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, four, five, six. So we know we have to um, um, start numbering amino acids starting at the amino end, at the end prime end. So whatever the amino end that sticks out, right, wherever the amino end sticks out, that's the number one amino acid. This is the C prime end because this is where the carboxylic acid group would stick out. So that's the primary structure. The secondary structure is formed when the backbone of a polypeptide interacts by hydrogen bonds. So let me explain what this means. In the linear chain of amino acids that are connected, we have the backbone portion, that's the peptide bond. These are all the peptide bonds. And the side chains or the R groups stick out of the backbone. So this is the backbone, and it's only the backbone that participates in secondary structures. Secondary structures do not include side chain interactions. So secondary structures are formed when the backbone, meaning the carbons uh, and the nitrogens that form the, the peptide bonds, make hydrogen bonds with each other. And there are three very common secondary structures you should be familiar with. Again, all of these are due to hydrogen bonding in the polypeptide backbone. Um, so you have an alpha helix. So again, alpha helices. You also have beta sheets, a beta sheet, or coils. So an alpha helix, a beta sheet, and a coil, A, a B, C, are the three types of secondary structures. So an alpha helix, now, um, without going, we could go into a lot of detail. If this were a um, advanced bio course or a biochem course, we could talk a lot about primary structure and secondary structure. But for now, I want you to understand that these are side chain. Uh, these are not um, involving side chain interactions at all. The side chains actually stick out. The hydrogen bonds that get made are between the car, um, the backbone only. So this is an example of an alpha helix. This just shows how the backbone orients itself. So this is how these are found in proteins. A beta sheet is just a different arrangement of amino acids. Um, you can see these dashed hydrogen bonds, again, are not between the R groups. They're only between the hydrogens um, and carbon and nitrogen, so between the backbones. So beta sheets and alpha helices are secondary structures in proteins. 
What type of bond is most involved in a protein's primary structure? You could pause here. The answer is D, peptide. What about the secondary structure? You can pause here. And the answer is A, hydrogen bonds. Moving up, we have tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure now involves the side chains. So the tertiary structure results from the interaction of all the amino acid side chains with other amino acid side chains or with the environment. So the tertiary structure is very important. Um, and the tertiary structure is dependent on the environment. So if the environment is aqueous or watery, right, the proteins will maintain a certain shape, a certain tertiary structure. And it's many different kinds of bonds, ionic, covalent, and hydrogen bonds between amino acids that enable very specific globular 3D structures. So three-dimensional tertiary structures, um, again, they're very specific and they're due to not only the amino acid side chains, but also the environment interactions. So this picture shows how you have two side chains from different parts of the backbone. So again, let me just define, this purple thing is the backbone of the polypeptide, and you're seeing how different side chains can interact with each other as well. So these two side chains are making hydrogen bonds with each other. That's an example of tertiary structure. These two amino acids are making a special kind of bond called the disulfide bond. Right? That's another example of tertiary structure. These two amino acids are both charged. This amino acid is positively charged. This amino acid is negatively charged. So these can make an ionic bond with each other. So all of these types of bonds are going to help um, conform and uh, twist the protein in a certain structure. Proteins always try to keep their hydrophobic and nonpolar side chains protected from the outside aqueous environment. So that makes sense. Most of us is made of water, right? Most of us is aqueous. So proteins usually try to keep their hydrophobic, their water fearing side chains on the inside. The hydrophilic amino acids on the outside can make what kind of bonds with the aqueous environment? Right, they can make hydrogen bonds. So if we have, here is an unfolded polypeptide where all the green amino acid side chains are nonpolar and all the blue amino acid side chains are polar. If this protein were to fold in an aqueous environment, all of the green nonpolar side chains would be buried in this core. So there's like this hydrophobic core of this protein. Whereas all of the polar side chains would be oriented on the outside so they can make hydrogen bonds, right, with the water molecules. So those are those dashed red lines. These hydrophilic um, polar amino acid side chains can interact with the aqueous environment when properly folded. So this is a very, very important concept. Um, this is one of the times I wish I were in person to... Um, show you a demo, um, but it's the interactions between amino acids and a polypeptide that determines how it folds, and how it folds determines its structure, and the structure determines its function. So protein conformation, not confirming, but conforming, protein conformation refers to the specific protein shape based on the way a polypeptide folds. So every protein has a specific stable conformation that it likes to have. And the way that it achieves this conformation is dictated in the sequence of amino acids. So try to visualize, right? Every protein has a specific sequence of amino acids. And depending on how far away the amino acids are from each other, right, they can form different kinds of interactions. So polar amino acid side chains can make hydrogen bonds with other polar amino acid side chains. Any negative side chain can make an ionic bond with a positive side chain, or a negative side chain could repel another negative side chain, so that can move them farther apart. And we said also nonpolar amino acid ch side chains try to interact with other nonpolar amino acid side chains to keep all those hydrophobic parts together away from the water. So together we have all these different forces 
acting on the amino acid chain, um, the chain of amino acids. And that will determine how the whole polypeptide folds. And again, how it folds determines the protein's conformation, which is the structure. And the protein conformation will determine how the protein can function. Right? And there's always hydrogen bonding um, between the environment as well. So what type of bonds are involved in a protein's tertiary structure? You could pause here. And the answer is D. All of the above are involved in tertiary structure. Proteins usually have a very preferred temperature and pH for them to be stable and to be conformed in the proper um, structure. So denaturing, denaturing the protein with either high heat or with chemicals will disrupt the natural folding of the protein. So denaturing means you're disrupting the structure of a protein. So a chemical called urea can be used to gently unfold proteins. So it can kind of get rid of all the hydrogen bonds and break a lot of the bonds. So if I have a pure protein that's folded properly, and I expose it to a high concentration of the chemical urea, it will be denatured. This protein is now denatured. What do you think will happen if I remove all the urea and I put that protein back into like a buffer that's really balanced, like it has a good pH, good temperature? Since all the amino acids are still held together in the same sequence, when I remove urea, the same conformation will be reformed. Because remember, each amino acid is already determined to make interactions, right? Each amino acid will then find um, the right kinds of bonds to make with its neighbors and with the environment to form the original conformation. So sometimes you can denature a protein and then renature it. So sometimes denaturing can be temporary, but sometimes it can be permanent. And that's the case with very high heat. If you take an active protein and expose it to very, very high heat, then it's permanently inactive. Um, so an example would be like a fried egg. The albumin in an egg white is normally in its proper shape. But once you expose that egg white to high heat, um, it completely disconfigures the albumin protein, um, in fact, causing it to uh, become white uh, because it got denatured. And there's no way to get a fried egg back into the egg white form. And it's permanently denatured. So like I said, the sequence of amino acids determines the precise conformation a protein can have in order for it to function. And there's usually, you know, there's only one way to fold a protein. There's only one stable form of a protein. So a polypeptide can try many different conformations, but there's really only one stable folded conformation. Finally, we have the quaternary structure of a protein, which is not found in all proteins. So only certain proteins have quaternary structure. And quaternary structure is the structure of a protein that results when two or more separate polypeptides interact to give a larger protein complex. So an example is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is found in our blood cells, um, a lot of it. And hemoglobin is actually four separate subunits. So you can look at the primary structure is the amino acid side chain. Secondary structure are the hydrogen bonds between the backbone. Then the tertiary structure is how the group interacts with side chains and its environment. But in fact, hemoglobin has four separate tertiary structures. So over, so each of these is a separate tertiary structure. Altogether, we could say that the four subunits that make up hemoglobin is the quaternary structure. And it's can, this example, um, Hemoglobin just happens to be a tetramer, which means it has four subunits, but that doesn't refer to quaternary. Quaternary just means more than one subunit. So microfilaments are proteins that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of subunits, and that's also the quaternary structure. So hemoglobin happens to have four subunits, 
um, and that represents its quaternary structure. So I would pause right here on this image and take a close hard look at this diagram that shows primary structure, which we said is the sequence of amino acids attached by peptide bonds. We then spoke about secondary structures like an alpha helix or a beta sheet that's hydrogen bonding between amino acids in the backbone. We have tertiary structure, which depicts the amino acid interactions with the watery environment or the side chain interactions that determine the 3D shape of a protein. And finally, the quaternary structure results when two or more folded polypeptides interact to perform a single biological function. I want to take a quick look at mutations. Um, we just mentioned hemoglobin um, and a single change in an amino acid in a protein can have major consequences. So hemoglobin has about 574 amino acids, I believe. Um, but in sickle cell anemia, only one amino acid gets mutated, and that causes uh, sometimes very catastrophic effects for the entire body. We said hemoglobin is a quaternary protein made up of four subunits attached together, each of which has a special molecule called a heme group, which can carry oxygen. So normally, um, sickle cell anemia, oh sorry, so normally we have normal hemoglobin that makes blood cells look like this, like little disc shapes, like donuts. And because our red blood cells are shaped like this, they can fit through our small capillaries and they can deliver oxygen throughout our body very easily because they're flexible. They can squeeze through. However, if hemoglobin takes up a weird shape like this, it gets very sticky. So there is a mutation in hemoglobin where just the sixth amino acid, that's normally glutamic acid, gets switched to valine, a different amino acid with different properties. So we're just substituting one of the hundreds of amino acids in hemoglobin. That one mutation makes all the hemoglobin molecules stick to each other. Because hemoglobin sticks to each other, they form very long chains that make the red blood cells have a deformed shape. They look sickled now. They're no longer um, nice, uh, flexible blood cells like this. They're sickled cells. And what happens is they get stuck in capillaries and that can cause anemia, meaning a lack of oxygen delivery. So sickle cell anemia, again, because of one mutation in hemoglobin, causes the whole red blood cell to have a weird shape. That weird shape inhibits proper oxygen, oxygen delivery throughout the body. So one amino acid chain and change in just one of the thousands of proteins that are required for life can affect your entire um, body. So protein folding is incredibly important. We have special proteins called chaperone proteins that help other proteins fold into their normal shapes. Um, chaperone proteins, again, like chaperones, they guide the proper folding of proteins, and they can also help correct any misfolding of proteins. So chaperones are very important for proper folding of proteins. And we now have um, evidence that shows that certain diseases like Alzheimer's or cystic fibrosis uh, might have defects in chaperone proteins because Alzheimer's disease is a result of protein tangling and protein aggregation. They stick together. Um, so maybe chaperone proteins are defective because chaperone proteins normally prevent our other proteins from sticking together and from tangling. Prions. Prions are another very interesting um, type of molecule. Prions are types of misfolded proteins that are implicated in a group of fatal brain diseases. So prions are believed to cause other proteins to fold the wrong way. So it's almost thought about as being a contagious tertiary structure. So it's a one protein gets misfolded as a prion, that prion causes other proteins to be misfolded. And prions can cause TSEs transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, such as mad cow disease. 
So mad cow disease um, is caused by prions, misfolding um, in the brain. And some practices like eating raw brains of uh, cows transmitted the cattle disease to humans. So that's a little bit about protein folding. And we can visualize protein structures using specialized software. Um, you have access to free software called Star Biochem through MIT, where you can visualize protein structures. Um, scientists um, study protein structure using techniques called X-ray crystallography or cryo-electron microscopy. Um, actually, just today, um, I read in the news that with single, you could, for the first time, we were able to see single amino acids in a protein structure um, using cryo electron microscopy. So this, in a way, kind of freezes proteins in a certain shape and allows us to look at single atoms um, and their arrangement in a protein. And protein structure has everything to do with protein function. Protein function has everything to do with human health. So it's very important if you're thinking about medicine or um, any type of biotechnology, protein structure is very important to understand. And I'll play this video for you uh, now. Proteins carry out the labor in our cells. So we really need to know what they do and how they work. The key to proteins is their shape, because that dictates their function. They can take many different shapes. Scientists call these folds. Unfolded, a protein is a long string of amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids, and each one of them has its own chemical behaviors. When a protein folds up, you get a long, tangled piece of spaghetti with all these different chemical functionalities on it. It's not exactly like spaghetti because its 3D shape evolved over billions of years to do very specific jobs. If you can understand the minute details of the structure of proteins, not only do you get insights into their function, you might be able to change that function. So researchers have been trying for many years to solve the protein folding problem. Can we just look at the sequence of amino acids and predict how a protein is going to fold? You could take the amino acid sequence, plug it into a computer, and see if your algorithms are good enough to make sense of how it might fold. You can use x-ray crystallography or other techniques to image a protein structure, but that hasn't been done for very many kinds of proteins. A couple of decades ago, folks asked a separate question. Could all the genome sequence data, the three billion letters in our genome, and the billions in all the other genomes out there, could they scan that code, which is separate from the amino acid code of proteins, and learn anything about how proteins might fold? The DNA in our genes codes for RNA, which is translated into proteins. So there's a relationship between the four-letter DNA code and the 20-letter amino acid sequences of proteins. Because a protein wraps around in many different twists and turns, the sixth amino acid in that chain might end up next to the 18th amino acid. If they end up next to each other, researchers realized there might be an interaction between the pair that is critical to the shape of the protein and therefore its function. If that's true, then a mutation in the DNA that changes one of the amino acids must be accompanied by another mutation to the other member of the pair to preserve the interaction. In essence, they co-evolve. Well, if you can log maybe a hundred or more of those cases of close by neighbors in 3D space based on looking at many genome sequences, then you can plug that into your folding program. Now that it has all these tight constraints, it gives a much better chance of getting a really accurate structure. And it works. The upshot is scientists can fold lots of proteins that they never could before. That's important because it will give new insights into how those proteins work. Beyond that, researchers have been steadily improving the ability of computers to model the shape of proteins, and this now enables them to design their own proteins, making things never seen before in nature. The most obvious application is medicine. They can target very specific parts of the flu virus with a special built protein, enabling a vaccine that works across flu strains. They've designed proteins that naturally assemble into tiny cages that can deliver different molecules in the body or new materials like engineered surfaces that self-assemble could be used in solar cells and electronic devices. You can go in a thousand different directions. 
So now we'll talk about nucleic acids. So nucleic acids. In each of our cells that have a nucleus, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And each of these chromosomes contains genes. And these genes are the instructions that tell our cells what to do and how to do it. And of course, you know that genes are made up of DNA. And DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. So DNA is an example of a nucleic acid, deoxyribonucleic acid. And DNA is made up of bases called nucleotides. So nucleic acids encode genetic information, just like DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. And nucleic acids are polymers of nucleotides. So a nucleotide is one of the building blocks of a nucleic acid. Here's an example of a nucleotide. It has three components. Every nucleotide has a phosphate group, which is a functional group. Every nucleotide has a nitrogenous base, which is a special molecule that contains nitrogen. And every nucleotide contains a sugar. So every nucleotide has a phosphate, a base, and a sugar. And nucleotides are the monomers that make up nucleic acids. In the case of a DNA nucleotide, the sugar is a deoxyribose sugar, and that's why it's called deoxyribonucleic acid. So specifically in DNA, you have a deoxyribose sugar. In addition to the sugar and the phosphate, each DNA nucleotide can have one of the four nitrogenous bases. Note, these bases have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen in them. They can either have an adenine, a guanine, a thymine, or a cytosine. So these are four different types of DNA bases um, that can be in a nucleotide in addition to the sugar and the phosphate. So these four letters of DNA bases, the A, adenine, T, thymine, C, cytosine, G, guanine, make up the language of genetic instructions. So a gene um, which is instructions to make up a specific protein is consisting of these letters, C, T, A, 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 G. That refers to the different nucleotides. This is a cytosine nucleotide. This is a thymine nucleotide, adenine nucleotide, adenine nucleotide, adenine nucleotide, guanine. So this is the language of genetic instructions, these nucleotides. And as we'll soon see in later chapters, the genetic instructions um, dictate the protein instructions because DNA encodes for proteins. So DNA is like the software um, and proteins are like the hardware. So the DNA dictates um, the hardware of the proteins. So nucleic acids are polymers, meaning they're attached together. So nucleotides join together to form long polymers as strands. So this is a DNA strand. And it's the sugar and the phosphates of each nucleotide that make up the backbone of each strand. So each backbone is a repeated uh, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. The bases, the nitrogenous bases stick out, kind of like the rungs of a ladder, right? So the bases stick out and the backbone consists of the sugars and the phosphates. DNA is most stable in the form of a double helix. So in fact, DNA is stored as a double helix because it's most stable. And a double helix is two strands of DNA that are held together by hydrogen bonds. And remember, hydrogen bonds are very weak, so you need a lot of hydrogen bonds. Um, each of these pairs makes two to three hydrogen bonds with each other. So it's two separate strands uh, held together um, at their bases. And this is kind of what looks like that ladder now. It's like a double ladder. And the double helix is very, very stable. Um, this is what allows um, forensic anal analysts to look at just one drop of blood at a crime scene and sequence DNA. DNA is very stable, right? We can go back thousands of years and sequence mummies that are still having their DNA intact. 
Um, so the double helix is a very stable form of DNA because of all those hydrogen bonds. So if we were to, again, look at a double helix that consists of two strands of DNA, if we were to zoom in on the strands of DNA, they're made up of nucleotides. Which component of a nucleotide is not included in the DNA backbone? So pause here, and the answer is C, the nitrogenous base. Which type of bonds are formed between bases in a DNA double helix? Pause here, and the answer is A, hydrogen bond. So another nucleic acid you should be familiar with is RNA, ribonucleic acid. And RNA is a close chemical cousin of DNA, but it has some key differences. Notably, um, RNA uses the sugar ribose, right? Not deoxyribose, but ribose. And ribose sugar has an extra OH group over here. DNA does not have this oxygen here. That's why the DNA version is called deoxyribose. It does not have an oxygen here. It has just an H in, in deoxyribose sugar. Ribose sugar has an extra OH group, and that's what is uh, um, in an RNA nucleotide. One other difference is that RNA does not have the base T. There's no such thing as a thymine base in RNA. Instead, you see the base uracil, U. So RNA can have an A, G, C, or a U, where a DNA can have A, G, C, or a T. So this is um, a summary slide of the different nitrogenous bases found in DNA and RNA. A final key difference is that RNA is mostly single-stranded. Um, we don't see RNA in a double helical form as we do DNA. So here's a review of nucleotide structure. Here is a comparison of deoxyribose versus ribose. And here you can see the different um, bases. Pyrimidines, you don't have to know this, but are all single rings, and purines are double rings, like adenine and guanine. Right? Anything that ends in nine, N-I-N-E, is a double ringed purine. What is true about DNA and RNA? Pause here. The answer is C. Finally, the last example of a nucleotide or a nucleic acid you should know about is ATP. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is used by cells for energy. And ATP is known as the energy currency of the cell. So we need to eat glucose, we need to eat food, so our body can produce ATP. Our body can't use our glucose directly. It needs to be broken down into ATP first. And ATP, if you were to look at the structure, it's made up of an RNA nucleotide because it has a ribose sugar, an adenine base, but it has more than one phosphate, right? This would just be, this portion here would be the RNA nucleotide, but it has three phosphates in total. Adenosine triphosphate has three phosphate groups. And energy is stored in the chemical bonds between these phosphate groups. Specifically, this um, bond here that connects the second and third phosphate group on ATP has a tremendous amount of energy. So if you break this bond, energy can be released that the cell can use for some kind of work. So breaking that last phosphate bond releases energy for cellular work. This bond over here does have some energy too, and just not as much. When this third phosphate gets broken off, gets hydrolyzed, we then have ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and a free phosphate group. And we'll talk a lot more about ATP in another chapter, um, but adenosine diphosphate can then be rejoined to the free phosphate to make more ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So now I'd like to take a time to just review um, a little bit about biomolecules and apply some of the concepts uh, to some more relevant situations. So this is a good summary slide to pause 
um, make sure you understand carbs include polysaccharides, which include disaccharides, which are composed of monosaccharides. Lipids include fats and oils that are made of triglycerides that are made of fatty acids and glycerol. Proteins are composed of peptides, which are made up of amino acids. Nucleic acids include RNA and DNA, which are composed of nucleotides. And ATP is also made up a special, it's a special nucleotide with three phosphate groups. So here's a good summary slide to review with. And if you were to just look at some of the foods you eat, so suppose you look at a peanut butter label, you'll see several examples of biomolecules. So right now, I'd like you to pause the video here and tell me which types of biomolecules you can see in this nutrition facts. And then, so for each of these, tell me um, as much information as you can about each of the biomolecules. So pause here, it's a good exercise. So over here, we can see a group of lipids, right? We have fats, um, some of which are saturated fats, right? Because of the saturated fatty acid tails. So peanut butter is a solid at room temperature because of that saturated fat. There's no trans fat in this peanut butter. That's good. And there's no cholesterol. Cholesterol is also a lipid. Sodium is not a biomolecule. Sodium um, and iron are both elements. So those are minerals. Those are not considered biomolecules. Here we have carbohydrates, right? We have not only sugars in the form of cane sugar, which is sucrose, right? We also have dietary fiber, right? What is dietary fiber? That's cellulose, right? That's also a polysaccharide. And finally, we have proteins, right? That's actual the coming from the, the peanut itself. Um, has proteins. So you can see we have uh, three categories of biomolecule in our peanut butter. And I'd like you to do the same with chocolate. So what type of biomolecule is in each ingredient in this chocolate bar with almonds? So you could look at the source here. And as part of the reading for this week, you're going to read the relevancy mo module on the biology of chocolate. And you're going to learn a lot about how chocolate is made, about how our body processes chocolate, um, and some of the impacts that chocolate production has on the environment. So here's a quick question. If you want to eat a snack that provides rapidly available energy without excess calories from other biomolecules, which nutrition label should you choose? So pause here and take a close look. See which would provide us with rapidly available immediate sources of energy without excess calories from other biomolecules. So the answer would be B. Um, you can see that you would look for carbs. That's what you want um, the most of. You want rapidly available, just strictly carbs. Um, fats would have long-term energy. So you want to avoid fats and you don't need calories from proteins. You just want instant blood sugar. So you have 65 calories that come mostly from the sugars and this product B. Um, this one does have some sugars, but it also has a lot of protein that will contribute to the caloric intake. So B is the best option. I wanted to take uh, a moment, uh, since viruses are more prevalent than ever, I want to take a look at viruses and point out that viruses utilize all four biomolecules for them to divide and infect us or infect plants or animals. Viruses use proteins to make up their coat. So proteins are found on the outer portion of viruses. The genomes of viruses consist of DNA or RNA, which are nucleic acids. So the instructions for a virus are DNA and RNA. Carbohydrates use special carbo, sorry, viruses use special carbohydrates to trick our immune system, to hide from our immune system. So it's called glycosylation. So there are special sugars on um, viruses, on the coats of viruses that trick our immune system into thinking that they're not really there. And lipids are found on viruses as well to protect them. So many viruses have a lipid envelope to give them an extra layer of protection. So viruses, um, what are they? They're associated with a number of plant, animal, and human diseases, and they can only reproduce using the metabolic machinery of a host cell. So they're non-cellular. 
uh, and we, they could have an RNA or DNA genome. And we just discovered them uh, recently because we um, have the means of seeing them. So for a while, we've been faced with viruses since the dawn of time, and they've caused uh, catastrophe and many pandemics throughout human history. But we didn't understand what viruses were until Louis Pasteur um, kind of came up with the concept of a virus. And we didn't visualize a virus until the invention of an electron microscope. So with all this information, I want you to think about, are viruses alive, right? They have DNA genome, have all four biomolecules, they can cause disease, they can develop, they can um, reproduce, they can even mutate, they can evolve and adapt. So are they alive? And the answer is no. They're not cellular. They're not made of cells. So viruses are not alive, right? They can't reproduce on their own, right? They need to actually use a host cell. And a good question um, I want to just end with is how did these biomolecules ever even appear on Earth to begin with? Right? So we know that biology is the study of life and all living things have these biomolecules, but how did these biomolecules come to be? And in the coming um, lecture, the next chapter talks about cells. And cells are basically uh, compartments of biomolecules. They're storage containers for biomolecules. So how did biomolecules originate on our planet? And there's a hypothesis that the harsh conditions on early Earth about 4 billion years ago, meaning very high pressure, high temperature environment, made it possible for very small molecules to combine with each other. So in very early Earth, 4 billion years ago, we have evidence that there was carbon dioxide gas and hydrogen gas and liquid water, uh, water vapor, ammonia, and methane. And these gases might have combined in such a way that they could have produced lipids and monosaccharides and nucleotides and amino acids, which would then later polymerize into more, um, more complex macromolecules that all living things require. So these biological macromolecules formed in a sort of chemical prebiotic soup of all of these um, smaller chemicals. And this experiment, um, there's a very famous experiment called the Miller experiment that tried to see if this hypothesis um, could be correct. So what he did was he tried to simulate the early conditions of Earth's environment. So he took a flask with gases that were found on early Earth's environment, like water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. And he exposed them to tungsten electrodes, which would simulate lightning that was probably present on early Earth. And in, um, in addition with water vapor, so from boiling water, which produced vapor, and the electricity, he saw that these gases produced organic compounds. So he actually saw that in a simulated early Earth environment, very simple molecules can combine into very complex organic molecules just on their own. And he found amino acids in here. So it is not unlikely, and it's not really hard to believe, that early Earth's conditions uh, of just gases might have produced these biomolecules, which later would have combined and been packaged into lipid membranes. And those are the precursors to early cells and more on cells next time. So this is a good overview of the chemistry of life. Uh, this combines chapters two and three. We said atoms consist of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and atoms are held together by chemical bonds. Chemical bonds may be ionic, they may be covalent. Um, covalent bonds in turn might be polar or nonpolar, depending on electronegativity, or those chemical bonds may be hydrogen bonds. Hi uh, chemical bonds are formed uh, between atoms to make molecules. If they contain carbon and hydrogen, these molecules are called organic. And organic molecules include carbs, nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. So I'd like you to look through this question. You can pause here. And the answer is D, right? Enzymes are made up of amino acids, not monosaccharides. Which of the following biomolecules contain nitrogen? Pause here. The answer is D. Both A and B, both proteins and nucleic acids, contain nitrogen. And in proteins, remember, they're made of amino acids, and an amino group has nitrogen in it. 
So that's the giveaway. Um, also, think about nucleic acids. What make up nucleic acids? Nucleotides, right? What's in a nucleotide? You have a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. So proteins and nucleic acids both have nitrogen in them. Which of the following does not contain glucose of these four? So you can pause here. And the answer is A, steroids is a lipid. Um, whereas starch, sucrose, and cellulose all contain glucose. Which of the following is partially nonpolar? The answer is, you can pause here. The answer is C, phospholipids, right? Wax is fully nonpolar. Disaccharides and sodium chloride are polar. So that is it for chapter three. You have a lot of studying to do for this weekend because the quiz is on chapters two and chapter three. It's probably, like I said, the most information you're going to have on a quiz for a very long time. So please put in the time required. Review, review, review. And you have two um, lecture reviews that are due as well. Um, uh, they're due on Thursday, not Sunday. The quizzes are due on Sunday. The lecture reviews are due on Thursday. Um, so make sure you study hard and email me with any specific questions. I'll see you next time for chapter four when we talk about cells.